how cool is this? I get to stand up in front of you lovely people and talk about DevOps. Um, it's that cool. I'm going to take a picture of you all. Right, get a smile. Cool. Right, the real reason for the picture. Anybody who leaves during the next 45 minutes, I will hunt you down. So, um, first thing, uh, an apology or, or more of a clarification. So, the, the talk is titled Surviving a DevOps Journey. Probably the worst title I could have come up with because if you're in the middle of a, of a DevOps transformation or a digital transformation and you're seeing it as a journey that has an end, you're doing this wrong. The idea of a DevOps transformation or a digital transformation is that we're trying to build organizations that can react to changes in the marketplace, that are, that are agile and that are able to transform and continue to evolve as, as, as the, the marketplace and the, and the environment that they're operating in change. So it's a dreadful title. I do apologize. Um, I'll try and come up with something a little bit more uh, uh, accurate next time. Um, in terms of questions. Um, happy days. If anybody's got any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, we'll, we'll see how we go um, answering them. I'm conscious that, that not everybody's overly comfortable putting their hand up in an environment like this and answering questions. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, my DMs are open. Feel free to send me any questions you have during the talk. When we get to the end, we'll have a look and uh, you know, hopefully answer the questions. Um, this serves two purposes. You know, for, for anybody who's on the kind of introverted end of the spectrum, it gives you a safe way to ask questions. It also means that when I stand here and I look out and everybody's sat down on their phone, I can kid myself that you're all sending me questions and not just, uh, you know, surfing Facebook or, or, or whatever. Um, so, uh, as, as was just mentioned, my name's Ed. I'm a DevOps product manager at the DevOps group. Um, three parts to today's talk. Um, I'm going to start off with a bit of a, you know, an introduction to DevOps and digital transformations just to make sure that we're all... Um, on the same page, um, and then the, the, the kind of the, the, the bulk of the talk is, is you know, 18 months in, in digital transformation. What, what are the five kind of key things that, that I've learned along the way that I wish I'd known, you know, when, when I started off on that journey? And then to, to wrap things up, um, some, some personal notes and some takeaways, which hopefully will, uh, will make things a little bit easier for you. <coughs> so DevOps is changing the world, okay? Um, we're living in an unprecedented time at the moment. Uh, technology is evolving as quick as it, as it ever has. Organizations are responding to that. And if ever you do a talk like this and you, you kind of Google, you know, how to give a good talk, um, the first thing they always tell you is start with a story. And all good stories start in the pub. So once upon a time, in a pub about 140 miles back down the M4, I'm sat there with my wife. It was, it was March of this year. And it was snowing, and the weather was foul, and the dog was grumbling and wanted to go home. And we were just having this conversation about, you know, basically how, how grim it was. And what we really needed to do was, was go on holiday. So one drink led to another, and uh, out, out came the iPhone, and out came Airbnb. And uh, over the course of the next point, uh, we had found ourselves this lovely villa in Croatia. Uh, we booked it. Um, we figured we'd better try and work out how we were going to get there, so still in the pub, still in, enjoying a pint. We booked ourselves some flights on EasyJet. Then had that kind of clash of reality of going, oh, sh just booked myself a holiday, should probably book some annual leave. So <coughs> logged on to PeepHR, booked myself some annual leave, all is good with the world, a little bit of a, a parking to make sure that we can park at the airport, and um, given that this was a bit of a whim, a little bit of travel insurance just in case we need to cancel this at the last minute. So we sat in the pub, <laughs> we spent an hour, we've had two pints, we spent a small fortune, but at least we now have something to look forward to in the summer. So fast forward a couple of months, you know, the sun's now shining, we're heading off to Croatia in a, in a couple of days, and suddenly you get that realization that you don't quite have all of the things that you need to go on holiday, but don't worry, because Amazon Prime has your back. And then, you know, we may have neglected, because we booked this in the pub, to book a hire car, but we found a nice online place that let us do that in, in a couple of minutes without too much... Uh, without too much drama. So everything unfolds as you would expect. We, you know, we, we get to the airport, we park, we, we, we get ourselves out to Croatia, and as we land and we turn on our phones, we get a WhatsApp message. So book through Airbnb, brilliant host on Airbnb. I would share her details and the villa, but frankly, I don't want anybody else to know about it. Um, but we get a WhatsApp message from her, which basically said, um, don't worry about waiting till four o'clock to check in. Come straight across the island now. You can check in when you're ready, but before you come, you probably want to go to the supermarket first, otherwise you're going to come all the way to the villa and then go basically all the way back to the airport. My knowledge of Trogir is not that good, so I have no idea either where the villa is or where the supermarket is, but not to worry, because Waze has your back. 
So we get to uh, we get to the supermarket, we do our shopping, we pay on Monzo because frankly, why would you go and change money before you go on holiday these days? And by this point, we've been traveling for about 12 hours, the kids are getting a little bit grumpy, but somebody packed the Amazon Fire TV stick and remembered the password for Netflix. So it gets to the evening, the kids are settling down watching the telly, um, and uh, myself and my wife, uh, we head out to the, uh, to the hot tub, which is overlooking the sea with a, with a bottle of beer, and uh, this cunning notice that actually this hot tub has uh, Bluetooth speakers uh, embedded in it. So uh, quick Google to find the model of the hot tub, to download the instructions to figure out how to connect your iPhone to it. And we can sit in the hot tub looking out over the sea, listening to Spotify. Life feels pretty good at this moment. And we spent a week in Croatia. We went to a lot of restaurants. We ate out a lot. And when we did, it was TripAdvisor that told us whether or not it was a, a half-decent place for us to try or whether we should avoid it. And when I got tired of driving, because frankly, for it is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful country, but the driving does leave a little bit to desire, be desired, um, we use Uber to get around. So for anybody who says that DevOps is not changing the world, the view from my hot tub following a cold, wet, March evening in Cardiff would, would beg to differ. So the world is changing. DevOps is changing the world. But what, what actually is DevOps? So we have a definition that we use, as I think most, most consultancies do. So when we talk about DevOps, we talk about a set of patterns and practices and behaviors that are correlated with high-performing IT teams. It's a bit wordy. So what does it really mean? So DevOps is the way that, as organizations delivering products and services, we are able to deliver with both speed and stability. All of the evidence now tells us that these two things are no longer a trade-off. The, the slow and safe model of, of delivering software into production is, is behind us, and we're, we're operating in a different world. So we can expand on that a little bit, and, and we can talk about DevOps. It's, it's the, the art and science of high-performance IT. And what I really like about this definition is, is we talk about the science of, of DevOps, that you know, this is a technology-led initiative, but it's also an art. We're, we're dealing with people, there's, there's lots of cultural elements to this, and we don't have all the answers. This is a constantly evolving discipline. So for me, this really sings to, uh, to what, you know, what DevOps really is. And the, the purpose of this, uh, this introduction is really to, to get us to the point where we understand that organizations need to change. And it was, it was John Cotter who I think summed this up probably the best when he talked about how the hierarchical structures and organizational process was used for decades to run and improve our enterprises are no longer up to the task of winning in this fast-moving world. If you have an organization or you work for an organization that's still working in the same way that you worked you know, 10 or 15 years ago, and you're trying to compete with, with young, fast-moving, upstart companies that don't carry that, that legacy of, of technical and organizational debt, then, then you're not going to, to succeed. And this, this problem is not limited to those industries that you might traditionally expect are being disrupted. There was a, there was a report that came out of, of IDC I think in, in uh, early, earlier this year, where they started to try and map which industries were being disrupted by which organizations. And I love this slide, and our marketing team lose their minds a little bit when you put it up, because they go, nobody's gonna be able to read it. You know, people at the back can't read the slide. That's kind of the point. There's so many companies and organizations disrupting so many markets that actually you can't get it legibly onto a slide. And this really is the, the tip of the iceberg. So. What, what do we do about it now? So the answer to, to surviving this level of disruption is, is, is DevOps. And there's lots of organizations now talking about you know, digital transformations. And, and I've been uh, lucky, I think, to have been involved in one for the last 18 months. And over the next kind of 30 minutes or so, hopefully we'll, we'll go through sort of five things that, that I wish I'd known. So first thing that, that I think uh, is, is probably the most important thing to, to a digital transformation is, is the role of leadership. So quick, quick show of hands. How many people here consider themselves in a position of leadership within an organization? Okay, so 10% maybe. So I love this, this definition of, of leadership. Um, it says if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. And one of the things that's really important when we start to talk about leadership within a transformation is that leadership exists at every level of our organization. So it's not defined 
by our org chart. It's defined by, by this statement, by the way that we're interacting with our colleagues and, and, and the teams around us. But why, why, why is leadership so, so important? So um, for anybody who's <laughs> had the misfortune to hear me speak before, um, I'm a big fan of uh, DORA and the State of DevOps Report and the research that comes out of uh, the US every, every year and, and talks about how, how DevOps is affecting the industry. And they, they give us this diagram um, once a year which maps out the things that drive high performance IT and, and organizational performance. And the one that I just wanted to, to shine a light on, quite literally, is transformational leadership. So what, what this actually shows us is that we know that, that DevOps as a set of patterns and practices is, is reliant on, on lean product management and it's le um, lean management and technical practices around continuous delivery and continuous integration. But what's really interesting is we can't have any of those things without transformational leadership. It really is the thing that, that, that underpins digital transformation and, and high organizational performance. So it's important, but when we talk about leadership, what, what do we actually mean? So I think if we're going to talk about, about leadership, we need, we need to talk about you know, what, is, what is the foundations of, of, of good leadership. And for me, that this, this comes down to two things. This comes down to courage. And it was Brené Brown who I think summed this up really well. And she talks about, you know, when in, in this day and age, if, if we're going into to work in these organizations that's being, that are being transformed, and, and to use her words, not mine, you are going to get your ass kicked. It's not a case of if, it's a case of when. This is hard, you're gonna get knocked down. Courage is going into a situation knowing you're going to get your ass kicked, but you will get back up and keep moving forward and take that team with you. And humility. I think goes hand in hand with that. So we're moving, we're, we're operating in a complex world. Traditional command and control management really doesn't cut it. We need humility in our leaders. We need leaders who accept and acknowledge that they don't have all of the answers and are prepared to push the decision making to the people with the most information. So as a leader, you need to be able to put your hand up and say, I do not know, but we'll figure this stuff out. So. If we take humility and courage, there's, there are five pillars of, of transformational leadership which came out of um, some research which was conducted in, in 2004, and I think they're as applicable today as they were when they first came out. So the, the first one here is um, intellectual stimulation. So this encourages people to see changing environments as opportunities for growth and development. So what we're really talking about here is we're talking about promoting that, that growth mindset in, in the people that, that we work with. The second one is, is vision. So a leader should have a clear vision of where that organization or team is heading. And I think that's a really important distinction and, and we'll keep coming back to that idea. Personal recognition praises and, and acknowledges the achievement of goals. I think we've all sat in those meetings before where that manager to differentiate from leader has taken credit for the, you know, the decisions that you made or the work that you did or the direction that you helped to, to shape. You know, transformational leadership is not about that. It's about offering personal recognition where, where it's deserved. And inspirational communication. So uh, transformational leadership is about being able to, to communicate with our teams and, and take them on that journey with us. And finally, supportive leadership. That's, that's Ian from ASOS, if anybody wants to uh, make him feel really bad for interrupting my time. <laughs> and, and finally, supportive leadership. So uh, these, are, these are leaders that, that demonstrate care and consideration of the followers' needs and feelings. So really caring about the people that are in your team and helping them to bring their whole selves to work. We're asking people to operate in a really difficult environment when we take them on these transformation journeys. So how do we make, it, make that safe and make it you know, be supportive of them? And I think if you take those, those five pillars and, and you have a foundation of humility and courage, you have transformational leadership. So that's all right in theory, um, but what does it actually look like in, in practice? So I thought, you know, for me, um, at a <laughs> Windows-centric conference, if you're gonna talk about leadership, there's, there's probably only one person that, that I, you know, I could think of to talk about. So for anybody who doesn't know who this is, so Satya is the CEO of Microsoft. Uh, he's been in post for a few years now, and I think it's fair to say has revolutionized the organ organization. And I say that with uh, somebody who, who started out back in the day as a kind of classic ASP v6 guy in the not so good days when Microsoft was um, certainly not the cool tech giant to be pinning your colors to. Um, so is anybody here familiar with uh, a project that came out of Microsoft called Tay? 
Yeah, a couple of, couple of hands. Okay, so, so Tay was an AI project at Microsoft. And the idea behind Tay was that it was to improve human and computer interaction by providing a way for computers to interact in a human-like way. Um, it was a really, really interesting uh, project. Um, it was actually a bot. Um, the mistake that I think Microsoft probably made was the data that they were using to train this AI bot um, was Twitter, which is pretty much the cesspit of humanity in terms of you know <laughs> moderate views and um, uh, and such like. So so basically, Tay, Tay was launched and um, within 16 hours was quickly take, taken offline as it turned into a racist, homophobic bigot. But what you need to do, I think, when we talk about the story, which, which is quite funny, unless you happen to have been the product manager behind Tay or one of the developers working on that team, who, you know, you've not just hit the front page of Reddit, you've not just been slash dot, but you're now uh, New York Times, BBC, Guardian. You know, this is not just the Reg having a bit of a snidey dig at the fact that you've kind of cocked up. This is, this is front page news. So you're kind of going into work the next day and thinking, you know, writing could be on the wall. You know, wonder if Oracle are hiring. Um, and you get into work the next day and you have an email in your inbox that says this. It says, keep pushing and know that I am with you. The key is to keep learning and improving. That is transformational leadership. That is a CEO who has the back of his team. And when Satya was pushed on this, he, he, went, he went even further and he said this. He said, it's crucial for leaders not to freak people out, but to give them air cover to solve the real problem. If people are doing things out of fear, it's hard or impossible to actually drive any innovation. So it, it, it's, it's quite a high-level example. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about you know, the guy who runs one of the biggest corporations in the world. Um, uh, the question I think you need to ask is, is, is what does leadership look like in your organization? So uh, this is probably my favorite slide um, because during the transformation that I was working on, um, I had the real pleasure to work with an engineer who's, uh, whose name is Nathan, and he actually sent me a message last night to say that I was allowed to use his name. So I'm really, really pleased about that. So uh, Nathan had, had been involved with us with a, with a client that we were working on, and we, we spent probably six months, maybe a little bit less, doing some engineering work there, which was all about proving the art of the possible. So it was all about you know, getting features to that kind of MVP state. And for, for any engineers in the room, you've probably all been there. We got to MVP state, and they were like, we now have a bucket load of technical debt that we need to sort out, plus all the legacy technical debt that we inherited. And what we needed to do is we needed to try and find a way to get this team you know, to focus on the right things that actually meant that we could start moving forward at a sustainable pace. And we ended up with a meeting which was about 15 engineers, all fairly seasoned and grumpy and opinionated, as some engineers are, none of, none of you, obviously. Um, and the meeting was set up by one of the scrum masters, and the idea was, you know, we need to come up with our strategy for resolving technical debt going forward. Um, and it was quite an uncomfortable meeting because we were really trying to hammer home to people that we needed to start addressing some of this technical debt. And it was, it was really interesting that, that it, was, it was Nathan who, who kind of took control of this meeting. And, and we actually got this email from, uh, from one of the people in the meeting that said, you know, um, Nathan took the lead from the start and kept everyone on task. We did have a few points of uh, contention across teams, but Nathan patiently explained his perspective each time. He was uncompromising on our goal of improving quality, but pragmatic and open to others' ideas. It's kind of what you'd expect from your senior engineers or your, or your lead engineers. Um, this guy was three months out of college. You know, he was a long way off being a senior engineer, but for me, he exhibited all of the qualities of leadership that we expect to see in people, you know, many years his senior. And that leads us, so, so you know, we've got, we've got Satcher at one end of the spectrum, we've got, you know, we've got, you know, graduate engineers at the other. There's this perception that, that leaders are born, and some people just have these innate leadership characteristics. It was, um, I think, Vince Lombardi who said, you know, leaders are not born, they're made. And what we need to do is we need to try and work in, in organizations and create a culture where we can cultivate people. Um, and I'm going to illustrate that with a, another story of uh, somebody who I was very lucky to work alongside um, with the same client. So a uh, young lady on screen is uh, an intern who joined us uh, back at the start of last year. Uh, name was Charlotte. She originally came in as part of an engineering team. Uh, she had 
a real aptitude for, for coaching, and during her time with us, she pivoted um, into, a, into a coaching role. Um, following on from a period of training and mentoring, uh, we actually uh, unleashed her, I don't think would be an unfair phrase, into one of our internal teams that was trying to get to grips with some of the agile ways of working. And what was really interesting for me was when, when Charlotte left to go back to university, the team actually asked us if we had any more agile coaches that we could backfill her with. Such was the impact that she, was, she made on the team as a result of being in that environment that coaches and mentors and grows people into those roles. And for anybody who's met James Harvey, who's our head of academy, will not be surprised that he wanted to get a name check. Um, but this was the feedback we got. And, and I think what's really important is you know, leadership exists at all levels of our org chart and all, you know, anywhere in our teams, we just need to give people the opportunity to unlock that potential. Any questions so far? All good? <laughs> cool. Goodbye. So leadership, for me, the most important thing. Um, the next thing is, is about creating a, a vision. So any transformation, any change starts, starts with a vision. The key on here is, is create a vision for your context. There weren't that many people in the room who kind of put their hand up when I asked them if they were, would consider themselves leaders within their organization. So I'm going to suggest that I don't have many kind of CEOs here who are setting organizational strategy. This applies if you're a CEO setting organizational strategy or you're a, you know, a team lead within a, a, a cross-functional team or whether you're, you're simply a member of a, of a community of practice or a, a community of excellence. This still applies and it's still possible to drive, to, uh, to drive organizational change by starting with a vision. And, and what we need to do is, is create that North Star. We're not, well, it's not on about telling people how we're going to get somewhere. It's, it's telling them where we're trying to get to. What does good look like? Why are we going on this journey? Ultimately, what we're trying to do is, is create this sense of excitement. Change is hard. Digital transformation is really hard. But if we can get people excited about how good their life will be when we get there, you've got the makings of a, of a successful transformation. Because the reality is most people get scared when they can't see what the future holds. They don't need all the details. They just need to know where they're going and how their job will be better when we get there. So there's lots of, there's lots of ways that, that we can help you know, a vision to, to flow down through, a, through an organization. Um, because what, what we ultimately need to do is we need to take that vision at the top, which is the kind of organizational or team goals, and somehow we need to try and connect that back to the work that people are doing on a daily basis. If we can do that, getting people to make those, those fundamental changes to their ways of working or their, or their technical practices becomes very, very easy. So one of, the, one of the ways that we use and that I've used with, with clients and that I really like is to use a, a methodology which is called OKRs. So it stands for Objectives and Key Results. And what it allows us to do is take that top-level vision and actually tie it into the work that people are doing on a daily basis, and the, the, I think the best way to illustrate this is, is an example. So we've got a typical org chart here. At the top of the organization there, we've got our, our CEO, and down the bottom here, we've got kind of individuals or, or maybe small teams of people and potentially some teams or some departments in the middle. The way that OKRs work is that they allow, they allow the, the person at the top of the organization to define a destination, to tell you where they want to get to, and how they're going to measure it. So how do we know that we've got where we're trying to get to? Through the dotted lines as we flow down the org chart, the implementation is decided at the next level down. So this is not a command and control approach. This is very much a kind of a strategy and vision. So if we started off by saying that, you know, uh, we're, we're a software company um, and we sell pet food, okay? And we want to be the number one online supplier of organic pet food in the UK. This is our CEO. Three months, this is where we want to get to. And I will know that we've got there if we get 38% market share. Go. So now you've got some poor product team going, 38%. Oh, well, we reckon if we provide an excellent customer experience, we can get to 38% market share. And we'll know that we're providing excellent customer service if we increase our customer conversion by 25%. So now the teams know what it is they're trying to achieve. And then we get down to our slightly grumpy devs at the bottom who are really cynical about most things that come from the top of the org chart because they, they know what really needs to happen in order to do this. But 
you know, they're kind of looking at it going, customer conversion, I reckon we can do that. The problem is, <coughs> our checkout process absolutely sucks. You know, we know we're losing customers left, right, and center because this thing keeps crashing for reasons X, Y, and Z, but mainly because it's just flaky and it's, it's legacy tech and it's not particularly well written. But if we got clever about this, and we increased our unit test coverage by about 40%. We reckon we, could, we can stop losing customers in the checkout process, which is going to increase, increase our customer conversion, which hopefully will drive us to 38% market share. So suddenly, the engineer who didn't want to write unit tests because frankly couldn't see the point in writing twice the amount of code, because his code was good and it wasn't his code that was creating bugs in production, can draw a direct line between the work that, that we're asking them to do within the teams and the organizational objectives. And if we go back to the previous slide, this is a very, very clever way of connecting the work that people are doing to that vision. So third thing, leadership, vision. Customers are at the heart of what we do. Now, you may believe that you operate in an industry that isn't going to be disrupted by Amazon, but the fact is not that Amazon is going to potentially disrupt your industry, it's the fact that Amazon has had such a dramatic shift on the expectations of our customers these days that every market is being disrupted. If we, we cast our mind back a, you know, a few years, uh, you know, Amazon was selling books online, they're now selling everything online. I can now get pretty much anything I want tomorrow. If I'm lucky and I live in a big enough city, I can get most of the things I want today using Amazon Prime now. The customers who are used to using Amazon Prime and Amazon Prime Now are not going to see that it is reasonable for their mortgage application to take eight weeks. Or you know, their uh, uh, online booking system for their GP to be something that I can only do on the phone after half past eight in the morning where I hit their keep hitting redial. The level of expectation in organizations and in industries now is so divorced from what the customers actually expect and are becoming used to that these industries are now ripe for, for disruption, and, and the best example I've seen comes from a customer, fo any, before I said, anybody work in insurance? Okay, sorry. So, typically insurance, not the most customer focused industry in the world. Historically, it, it's kind of a thing that we have to buy. Um, great story which came out of, of um, the US. Okay, so a US um, insurance company called Lemonade Highly, highly, highly focused on customer experience, selling what is essentially a thing that nobody wants to buy. Um, and the story they tell is of a chap called Brandon, who, uh, for whatever reason, needed to put in an insurance claim for a, for a jacket, so for a, a, a parka that had become lost, damaged, stolen. Lemonade went through the usual insurance company process. They, they reviewed his insurance claim, cross-referenced it with the policy to make sure that this, this item was, was covered by the policy, um, ran 18 anti-fraud algorithms on it to make sure that there was nothing untoward going on. Uh, Brandon was a good guy, everything was above board, they approved the claim. Uh, and because they are customer-focused, customer-centric, they sent wiring instructions to the bank. I'm just gonna leave that for, for a second. Three seconds after he submitted the claim, the money was in his bank. So if you can explain to me why I still have to fax things to an insurance company, God only knows. But if customers are used to this level of experience, what are they expecting from your company in your industry? So the, the, the problem that we've got in IT is we're not used to listening to our customers because traditionally, we've been kept as far away from our customers as we can possibly be. And w one of the reasons was, was because uh, the way that our organizations have typically been organized has, has been uh, along the lines of, of something at the top where, where we have the business on the far left and we have a customer on the far right. And in order to get something into the hands of our customer, we go through this kind of theater of, of you know, the idea gets to the PMO team who, who kind of spin up a project and then we get some BAs to flesh out what we need to do and, and then we pass it off to some architects who tell us what from their ivory tower they think we need to build to meet the need. Which then gets passed to the devs who, who kind of have a bit of a laugh and say, no, 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 that, that's not gonna work. So we get a bit of backwards and forwards between architects and devs and 
the devs build some things, and the DBAs do some, some DBA thing, and the QA team <laughs> tests it and send it back to the devs because, frankly, we've never got very good at building stuff right the first time. And we send it back and say, no, 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 our code's fine, you're testing it wrong. And they send it back and go, no, 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 it really isn't working. And months have gone by, but it doesn't matter. Because here, we're doing Scrum. We're agile as you like. We've got two weeks Scrums, we're turning this stuff around really quickly, and we're gonna send it back to that QA team. And eventually, they kind of roll their eyes a bit and go, well, we need to get this thing into production because we've been going for about nine months by now. So we throw it over to service delivery and we go off and have a launch party because we're all good. And service delivery figure out how we're actually gonna get this thing into production and then, and then we throw it over to the poor ops team and, uh, and everybody goes to the pub while these, uh, these people try and work out how to make this thing actually run in production. And finally, the customer who wanted something 24 months earlier gets the thing that they no longer need or want because we've spent so long handing work backwards and forwards between these silo teams is it any wonder that the devs now have no real idea what the customers want when they're so far removed from them? So when we, you know, we talk about DevOps, one of the things that we look to do is, is we look to build what we're calling cross-functional teams where we're optimized for, fl for flow, where we're taking a very small idea and we're letting a product owner prioritize that on their backlog. And then you know, through some form of Azure Agile delivery methodology, we have a, a cross-functional delivery team that takes a selection of people from that above model, iterate really, really quickly, develop something of value, and gets it to the hands of our customer as quickly as they possibly can. So I was at a, a conference earlier, earlier in the week. Um, anybody here using Scrum, Scrum Agile? How many people got definitions of done? How many people's definition of done is working software in the hands of our customers doing something valuable? say two, maybe three people. That's the only definition of done that matters. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the people who are responsible for the work, the people who understand, you know, so the people who deliver the work to understand what it is that the customers really want. And we do that by, by reducing handovers between teams, by removing the cues of work that kill the flow of work through, through organizations, by working in the smallest possible batch size we can to deliver value. And by doing this, we improve our cycle time. So we go from six, 12, 18, 24 month cycle time to something much, 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 much shorter, which allows us to make really, really good decisions on, on what matters for our customers. <coughs> so it gives us a, a kind of an organization model which typically looks something like this. So a quick show of hands, who here identifies as a dev? Yeah, and most of the rest of you identify as ops people? Yeah. Looking at this going, you typical dev doesn't have a clue what you're talking about. It's not like that in my world. You know, I'm building out infrastructure. You know, I'm, I'm building out monitoring platforms. It's not the same. So what about if we do this? And we have a customer service desk and a triage team to, to kind of deal with incoming issues from our customers. And, and under that, we've got our cross-functional delivery teams who are delivering to the business's customer. But all of the people who sit in that traditional ops world are delivering in cross-functional teams products which are consumed by the delivery teams. So you still have a customer. The way that you work is exactly the same as those people who are interfacing with the public customer. You're understanding what their needs are. You're working out how best to deliver it. And you're doing it quickly and iteratively so that you can get feedback from them. So this idea that you know, we work in, a, in an infrastructure team where we build our environments, if we start to think about that as a team who build an environment product which is consumed by our delivery teams, the model that we talk about on the previous page works. And that allows these teams to be more agile and more iterative and to consume new technologies more quickly. And, and the end result of this is working, working software in the hands of our customers delivering value sooner. Okay, we're at, we're at point four or five, and I've just been told we've got, we got 10 minutes. So uh, um, the next one for me, okay, uh, this, is, this is really important. Um, change, is, change is hard. Any sort of change is hard. Organizational change is really hard. What we need to do is, is we need to care personally, and, and there's two ways that I believe that this manifests itself. So the first one is we need to understand what really matters in an organization because if you're gonna go and try and change an organization and change the way that people work, if you don't understand what's important, 
you don't know how people are going to react. So we've got this idea of, of organizational currency. And that can be any manner of things within an organization, but this is the thing that defines people are doing a good job within your organization. And that could be budget, team size, job title, the amount of time they've been there. You, you go into an organization, or indeed you are an organization where success as a manager is defined by the number of direct reports you have. And we start talking about building out an operating model where we're flattening the org structure and we're moving towards cross-functional teams. Suddenly, the things that these people have built a career around are being taken away from them. If you don't replace that with something else, you are going to get resistance. So the same applies to technical uh, definitions. So um, a really good example of this is, is try telling an exchange administrator that we're moving to Office 365. Cultural. This is the manager who is responsible for getting things done. They are the, uh, they, they, they shine a light on, on, on control, command and control management. They just managed to get their teams to deliver. And now we're talking about agile ways of working. We're talking about empowering teams. We're talking about pushing accountability and responsibility down the org chart. It's a really uncomfortable place for this person to sit. And it, it may well be that they were, the, you know, they were the functional expert in a particular area of the business or they used to work for company Y. You, know, you need to understand what the things are that you're about to change and take away from people and what the emotional attachment is going to be that they have to it. And it comes down to this. Change is really, really personal. You know, people, people spend a lot of time at work and they're very invested in the work that they do in the organizations that they work for. And I was talking to some, some change people at a conference a couple of weeks ago and um, the story of Charlie came up. Um, so Charlie, um, as I, we probably all met somebody who, who fits this bill, joined, joined the organization as a lead developer in 1998, built out the parts reconciliation middleware application that was launched in 2001 been enhancing, maintaining, and supporting that ever since. Charlie is our resident COBOL expert. <laughs> Gotta love Charlie. Charlie is really suspicious that these microservices can stale, and frankly does not believe for a minute that Java is performant. Anybody recognize Charlie? Anybody Charlie? <laughs> okay, Charlie is not a bad person. What's wrong with this story is how we are perceiving Charlie. If we flip that round, Charlie joined the organization in 1998, has an in-depth understanding of all of our core middleware, has a better grasp of the nuances of our business logic than anybody else in the business, understands what it takes to scale and integrate our systems, knows where the bodies are buried, and is excited about the technical challenges ahead. What's really, really important if we're going through an organizational change is we need to understand what people value and we need to let them understand what we value about them. We don't value Charlie because Charlie is a shit up COBOL developer. We value Charlie for all of those other reasons. So we need to, we need to stop defining Charlie in that particular way if we're going to take them on a journey with us. And having done that, we really do have to acknowledge that change is hard. You know, let's not pretend this is all going to be rainbows and unicorns. Any digital transformation is going to have its ups and downs. And in fact, there is this statistic which, which you will no doubt see time and time again that the brutal fact, uh, the, the brutal fact that is about 70% of all change initiatives will fail. Frankly, not helping, okay? We're taking somebody on a difficult journey, we're asking them to commit to it, we're asking them to become emotionally invested in it, and we're also saying, you're probably gonna fail anyway. The thing that really annoys me about that quote is that actually if you read the follow-up article, it's not even true. And actually it was founded on some, some misinterpretation of some statistics. And what I really like is, is what Nick Tassler wrote when he said change is hard in the same way that it's hard to finish a marathon, it requires significant effort. But the fact that it requires effort doesn't negate the fact that most people who commit to a change initiative will eventually succeed. And the key on here is commit. So if we can get the people in our organizations to commit to that change, we stand a much, much better uh, chance of succeeding. So can we stop preempting failure? Five minutes, cool, okay. Final point for, for me on this is, um, we're taking organizations on a journey, we need to learn to tell stories. If you're really running any sort of uh, digital transformation, the most important question you are going to have to answer is so what? So 
before we can, we can tell a good story, we really need to understand where we are today. So let's spend some time to quantify the pain that we're feeling. Understand why we're asking people to change and what's the, what's the journey that we're taking them. Do we understand what's in that context, what's important to our business? Um, and final point here is, are we doing anything with the data that we capture? Because most people are looking at it going, mm, it's really hard. Um, how many people have retros? How many people have loads of post-it notes if stuff that's broken and that they want to change? How many people do anything with those post-it notes? Okay, there's your data. There's your pain points. Those are the reasons you're looking to change. And then once we know why we need to change, we need to learn to tell stories and celebrate success. So here we have one of our cross-functional delivery teams, and they've just had a really good six months. And in the last six months, they've reduced the time to create an environment from four weeks to an hour. Uh, they've increased the first time acceptance of environments from 37% to 92%, and they've increased their unit test coverage from 32% to 85%. Hey, and we have automated the life out of our deployments using Octopus Deploy. No one cares. The stark reality of you telling stories like that is nobody give a monkey's what you've been doing in the last six months. What we need to do is we need to tell stories to the business in a language that they understand. So over the last 12 months, we've reduced the time to implement and deploy new features from nine months to four weeks. So this has given us eight weeks, uh, eight months of, of, of time where features are now running in production when they wouldn't have been before. So we managed to deploy feature XYZ in four weeks, and it now generates £175,000 of revenue per month for us to become the number one seller of organic dog food in the country. And we've got an ROI of £6 million in eight months. That's the sort of story the business cares about, not that you were using Octopus Deploy and you've managed to automate your environment. So understand what your customers care about. And if you're in a product team, that customer is the end customer of the organization. If you're talking about one of these platforms, what do your product teams care about? They probably don't care about tooling and technology. They care about how quickly they can get their test environments and how quickly their, their regression packs run. So I'm getting the eye. So in summary, my top five takeaways. Um, leadership matters, and leadership exists at every level within an organization, not, not just defined by your hierarchy. Start with a vision and use that vision to connect with people to the work that they're doing on a daily basis. Understand what matters to your customers, be those internal or external. Care personally about the people that we're taking on this journey and learn to tell stories. And those stories may be stories to, to peer teams of yours about the successes or failures that you've had. Let other people learn from your failures. We talk about the CALMS model of, of DevOps about sharing. We need to share the pain as well as just the success. And finally, I promise this is, this is the last bit. So, so the personal bit, uh, change is hard. Um, I sat down with the same bunch of change people where we were talking about Charlie and, and asked people how they were finding transformation. And it was kind of depressing. It, it was challenging. It was lonely. It was exhausting. It was uncertain. It was frightening. It was stressful. And it kind of left us going, well, you know, what can you do about it? So don't think that you're on your own and that nobody else is doing this stuff. DevOps as a movement is standing on the shoulders of giants. And there's a whole host of resources out there if you just know where to look. So find a community, speak to the community. Um, I have an Amazon reading list which just has a whole load of books and resources that you, know, you may or may not find useful. And if you're going on a, on a transformation journey, whether you're the CEO of an organization or a team leader or a, or a junior dev, and, and if you get that, I don't know if I can do this, um, uh, imposter syndrome sneaking in. This was my favorite tweet of, of recent times. So I think this, this really does speak to anybody who's involved in transformation. So uh, Brad Stolberg is a sports psychologist, um, works with a number of, of high performing teams, and he put this out when, when talking about imposter syndrome. A fraud is something that just about everyone feels at some point. There are two primary ways to shed this feeling. If you aren't acting authentically, start acting authentically. So those, those transformational leadership skills that we talked about earlier, start embracing those in your days of working. And finally, Remind yourself that no one has all of their shit together. That's just part of being human. Thank you.